Order. It is time for questions to the Minister of the Environment. Questions 1, 3, 7 and 11 have been withdrawn. I call Mrs Dolores Kelly. Mrs Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question 2, Minister. With uh, your permission, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to combine the answers to question 2 and question 9. The purpose of the Strategic Planning Policy Statement for Northern Ireland, or the SPPS, which I published on the 28th of September 2015, is to assist in furthering sustainable development under the new two-tier planning system. In the context of development in the countryside, the regional strategic objectives of the SPPS is to manage growth to achieve appropriate and sustainable patterns of development in support of a vibrant rural community, whilst at the same time conserving the landscape and natural resources of the rural area and protecting it from excessive or inappropriate development. The SPPS pitches planning policy at a more strategic level than planning policy statements previously prepared by the Department. It enables councils to bring forward bespoke local policies for the development of the rural parts of their own plan areas through their local development plans which will address their specific economic, social and environmental needs. Such policies can refle reflect and complement the provisions of the SPPS and may involve recognising areas that are particularly sensitive to change and areas which have lower sensitivities and thus provide opportunities to accommodate sustainable development. The SPPS recognises that the LDP process is the main vehicle for assessing future housing land requirements and managing housing growth across a plan area, both urban and rural. In order to achieve sustainable patterns of residential development consistent with regional guidance in the RDS, in preparing LDPs, councils must bring forward a strategy for housing together with appropriate policies and proposals that reflect the approach set out in the SPPS which is to ensure an adequate and sustainable supply of housing across the plan area. As long as a Council's planning policy takes proper account of the SPPS and Mr. the objective of it, up, unless he's asking for more time. I'd be most grateful if you could afford me more time, Mr Deputy Speaker, as this is a composite answer of quest to questions two and nine. Then councils may develop their own approaches to deal with the local issues that they face. In addition, due to the responses to the public consultation on the draft SPPS, my department is now taking forward a full review of strategic planning policy for development in the countryside. This review will require significant additional research and consideration and extensive engagement with key stakeholders, giving them an opportunity to influence the future strategic planning policy direction in this important area. My officials have already commenced preparatory work on the scope and content of the review, including the time frame for completion. Thank you. Call Mrs Kelly for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for... Uh, uh a very uh, a good answer so far in terms of uh, the sustainable development and the link across uh, councils and the uh, regional planning policy. But, Minister, sustainability, of course, has many interpretations, and I think there is a need uh, for sustainable populations in rural areas. And I know in my constituency, uh, under the area planning policy, white land is not to be developed upon across the whole of the Craigavonborough area, area until all of the land uh, that is deemed to be uh, plan and policy one, area plan and one, uh, uh, it's not to be used, the, the two, which is causing considerable problems in some rural communities. I think, Minister, it would be useful if you could outline that in some other parts of the rural areas there are, of course, dispersed rural settlements, question, and perhaps you could outline why the dispersed rural settlement communities isn't concluded within the strategy. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank Ms Kelly for that supplementary question. It might even have been longer than my answer to the previous <laughs> questions. As members will be aware, PPS 21 allowed for the designation of dispersed rural communities. This approach was retained in the final draft of the SPPS following public consultation, but ultimately, in the end, I was unable to secure executive agreement uh, with its inclusion in the final document. Whilst dispersed rural communities no longer feature in the SPPS, I am confident 
that the SPPS still retains an appropriate degree of flexibility. As I have said, the SPPS enables councils to bring forward bespoke local policies for the development of the rural districts within their area through local development plans, which will address their specific economic, social and environmental circumstances. As long as the Council's local planning policy takes account of the general thrust of the government policy in respect of development in the countryside, then councils are free to develop their own approaches to deal with the local issues that they face. Call Mrs. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the concerns as highlighted by his colleague there across rural communities of the continued rollback of services, including GP surgeries, post offices and indeed schools in my constituency, um, have certainly not been immune to it. So can the Minister give this House a commitment that the new strategic planning policy statement will lead to vibrant rural communities in the future, not continued rollbacks? I uh, thank uh, Ms Dobson for that question and, and certainly sympathise with communities in rural areas who are seeing an erosion of services available to them, often due to dwindling populations in those uh, once vibrant uh, com communities. While I cannot give her a guarantee that the SPPS on her own can address these issues, I am confident and can assure her that the SPPS does give councils now the opportunity to address these issues through their own local development plans. It does afford them the flexibility to do so. Uh, no one should be more aware of these issues and the impact that these issues are having on local communities as the councils and the councillors themselves. So I am very confident that they will uh, use the flexibility that the SPPS affords them to ensure the best possible outcome for their council area and the best possible outcome for their communities. Well, Mr John McAllister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for his uh, replies. Um, one of the concerns, Minister, I think you would agree, is the inconsistency sometimes with which councils view uh, planning policies, and at times they are so inconsistent in the application that that causes great uh, alarm amongst uh, those applying for uh, planning permission and uh, for development. Would he also consider that some of the councils are really struggling uh, to meet their to meet any level of service to the public and long delays building in. Would you consider setting an executive target uh, for uh, planning applications? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And, and I thank uh, Mr McAllister for his question. He does refer to inconsistencies of interpretation of uh, policy or PPSs across council areas, and I can certainly I suppose sympathise with that. I often see inconsistency among planners of interpretation of existing planning policy statements. And indeed, planning isn't really black and white, and nor should it be. It does allow uh, different people to interpret policy differently. It does afford flexibility and should afford flexibility. Uh, every application should be judged on its own merits. However, there shouldn't be the glaring inconsistencies of interpretation uh, to which the, the member refers. I have acknowledged in this chamber previously that the transition period, I suppose, of the handover of the planning function to councils on, on the 1st of April and subsequently has not exactly been seamless. However, I do believe that despite initial teething problems, the majority of councils are now coping admirably what I have to say is a much increased workload. I know speaking uh, to planners in the Derry City and Straban District Council area, they are now dealing with 150 more applications than the same office was at this time last year. Obviously, that is indicative of an upturn in the economy, uh, which we should all welcome. However, if there are particular issues with particular offices, 
or councils, I'd certainly be happy to speak to the member. I'll also be meeting with the chief executives of all of the councils to see how we can make planning work better for people. Call Mr. Danny Kennedy. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Grateful to the uh, Minister for his, uh, for his replies. Um, would he undertake to review staffing levels at the Newry Morn and Down uh, New Council area? Because uh, I am certainly aware of, of, of a significant pressure of work uh, to, uh, that would um, need some uh, assistance to deal with significant delays which are now occurring in the planning process uh, system. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank Mr. Kennedy for his question, the first that I have ever had the pleasure of getting, a privilege of trying uh, to answer. Employment levels within councils is clearly a matter for uh, the, the councils themselves. As I've said, I will be meeting with the chief executives and uh, chief planners in all the council areas in the, the, the coming weeks. And certainly, if members here and members of the public have raised issues with me about problems that they perceive to exist in certain areas, these are areas that I will be giving or urging the council chief executives to pay particular attention to. Often, uh, these backlogs can be due to a multitude of factors. Perhaps they're waiting consultation responses from Transport NA. <laughs> <laughs> or NIAA or other such bodies. Call Mr. Fergal McKinney for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four. I recognise that our high streets continue to face difficult challenges at the present time, and whilst the planning system is not the panacea, I believe that it does have a key role to play in allowing town centres the opportunity to retain and develop their retail base. The strategic planning policy statement that I published last month furthers this belief. It introduces new strategic planning policy to assist with supporting and sustaining vibrant town centres across the north through the promotion of established town centres as the appropriate first choice locations of retailing and other complementary functions consistent with the Regional Development Strategy 2035. The SPPS recognises the wide range and complexity of issues that influence the development, role, function and success of town centres. It therefore encourages councils to work collaboratively with all relevant stakeholders to inform the preparation of local development plans based on robust and up-to-date evidence. Under this new planning policy framework, councils will define a hierarchy of centres, consider their role and function, and develop a strategy for town centres and retailing that must promote town centres first for retail and other main town centre uses. In addition, a sequential approach will have to be adopted, with preference being given to town centre sites, then edge of centre before considering out of centre sites. Plans will also incorporate a new call for sites approach to identify available land to meet retail need. I consider more can be done to support town centres and the retail sector. My assessment is that this new strategic policy context and its key features can be a catalyst for facilitating successful, sustainable and attractive town centres. Well, Mr McKinney for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister and can welcome his comments around collaboration, but does he share the concern of the Northern Ireland Independent Retail Trade Association that the development of town centres and the retail sector requires a joined-up approach involving the executive councils and the sector? I thank uh, Mr McKinney for these uh, very pertinent and timely questions indeed. As I have said, going forward, more can and must be done to support town centres and the retail sector right across the region. I wish to see closer working amongst executive colleagues who have key roles to play in the creation of the thriving town centres that we all want to see. Urban regeneration, the provision of public transport and other infrastructure, rates and effective town centre management are but some of the necessary ingredients to create the mix of uses essential to the continued attractiveness of our town centres. 
With a greater array of powers or functions, I also believe that councils now have considerably more power to positively influence the shape, attractiveness and use of our city and town centres. Our retail sector is one of the most important elements of our economy, and I am confident that it has the resolve to respond successfully to present challenges and difficulties that we are all familiar with. Collective, we can all bring about positive change, economic growth and a more sustainable future for our city and town centres. Call Mr Sandro Overeem. Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. I would be interested to hear uh, from the Minister and his views on how the SPPS uh, now fits with, uh, with regard to such proposals as the, the John Lewis uh, development at Sprucefield. I uh, thank the member for her question and would remind the House that there is no application for John Lewis or from John Lewis at Sprucefield or anywhere here else in the North. The purpose of the SPPS is to set out clear regional strategic planning policy for the new two-tier planning system and this will allow the new councils to take account of the strategic direction and their plans and policies at local level. Therefore, it is not considered appropriate to include a specific site within the SPPS, and such issues should be, and I have no doubt will be, uh, dealt with through the local development plan of the new council. Call Ms. Bronwyn McGatton. Gurmey, I've got question five. <coughs> Excuse me. Due to a recently instigated legal challenge in relation to the Department's ongoing enforcement case, I am limited in what I can say on these matters. By way of background, when the situation was brought to my attention, I instructed officials to seek a voluntary cessation of the operations and to investigate and monitor any ongoing activity on the lock. Warning letters were sent to operators on the 25th of September 2014, advising that the unauthorised dredging activity constituted a breach of plan and control and should cease until this situation had been addressed. On the 27th of May this year, enforcement notices were issued to all relevant parties. The enforcement notices were to take effect on the 30th of June, unless appealed to the Planning Appeals Commission, or PAC. The Shaftesbury Estate appealed the enforcement notices on the 24th of June and the five sand operators lodged appeals with the PAC on the 26th of June. No parties have appealed the EIA determination. The enforcement notices have ceased to have effect pending the PAC's determination of the appeal. The grounds specified in the appeal have also had the effect of passing statutory responsibility from the Department to the PAC for determining whether planning permission should be granted for the stand, sand extraction activities concerned. In considering their decision in this matter, the PAC will consider inter alia an environmental statement to be prepared by the appellants. Thus, responsibility for determining the status of enforcement action and whether planning approval should be granted for sand dredging activities concerned has passed to the jurisdiction of the PAC. I uh, am acutely aware that this is a complex issue involving important environmental and socio-economic considerations, but in order to respect both the judicial process and the independent appeals process, including the rights of those parties involved, I do not intend to comment much further on these issues pending the outcome of these procedures. Call Ms McGavin for supplementary. Okay. Uh, and I, I thank the Minister for his response and I do appreciate there is a legal case. Considering the, the recent concerns expressed by the fishermen who work on the lock, um, does, when does the Minister expect the case to conclude? I, I thank the member for this uh, question and, and a supplement, supplementary question. And I'm aware of the concerns of uh, fishermen on the lock and the impact that this is having and has been having, they claim, on their livelihood for uh, some time. However, given the jurisdiction has now passed to the PAC, I couldn't even hazard a guess as to how long that this will take. It is the subject now of a judicial review legal action that has been brought by a third party uh, who would like to see 
stop notices uh, issued, which would, I suppose, satisfy to some extent uh, the, the fishermen. I'm, uh, that's currently the subject of a legal process. The PAC have also received a request from the appellants uh, to extend the time grant to them to submit environmental information until October next year. And I, I know that that has raised eyebrows and heckles in some quarters as well. Call Mr. Patsy McLoone. Uh, Gurma, good last year on Cole Yeggs. Mui, who's like an Ira Asin Regra, Air Nower Shaw. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response uh, on this particular question. Um, does the Minister acknowledge that the sand extraction on Loch Ney directly supports 150 jobs and up to 500 jobs indirectly in the Ashfeld concrete and precast sectors? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I uh, thank Mr. McLone uh, for that question. As I said in response to the original question, I'm acutely aware that this is a very complex issue involving a lot of extremely important environmental and socio-economic considerations. Uh, industry estimates vary between the 150 persons directly employed right up to 200 persons directly employed in the working of materials from Loch Ney, and up to, I've heard, no, you, you gave a more conservative figure, uh, Mr McLone, but up to 1,000 people indirectly involved or employed in the supply chain. As I said, a legal challenge has been instigated against my department, and I shan't be able to comment further at this stage. <laughs> Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As the Minister outlined, he has issued warning letters and unauthorised sand dredging continued. He then issued an enforcement notice and unauthorised sand dredging continued. Will he now issue a stop notice to make sure that unauthorised sand dredging cannot continue? I thank uh, the, the member for that question and, and I suppose gratefully accept his acknowledgement of the attempts that I have made in this regard. When the matter was first brought to my attention, I instructed officials to seek a voluntary cessation and to investigate and monitor ongoing activity on the lock. The warning letters were sent out over a year ago now, advising that this unauthorised activity constituted a breach of planning control. There, between that stage and issuing the enforcement notices, we had to go through a lengthy process of actually gathering sufficient evidence that work was ongoing. And I know we had plenty of anecdotal evidence, but it had to be evidence that we thought was robust enough that we'd be able to defend an enforcement action on, which we now find ourselves in the position that we, that, that we have to defend that enforcement action. With regards to the failure, <laughs> Mr Agnew might put it as, uh, to serve a stop notice uh, along with or now subsequent to the enforcement notice. Given the legal challenge that has been instigated, I can't comment further on that particular question. Well, Mr Cathy Washington for a question. Uh, Cormac, I would ask you to question six. An interdepartmental group has been established to take forward an agreed guidance and policy document for run of river hydroelectric schemes. The interdepartmental group consists of DECAL, LOCKS Agency, Rivers Agency, DOE Planning and NIEA. The guidance and policy document will set out clearly the requirements for each of the various departments. It is not the intention to provide a design brief for these installations. It is anticipated that this group will produce an interdepartmental guidance policy document by summer next year. Mr. Oshin for supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer, but the Minister will be aware that in the other jurisdictions on these islands that a design brief and guidelines does exist. And would he not agree with me that it would be, uh, given the numbers of hydro schemes that are being installed, particularly in rivers uh, at the moment, uh, that it would be uh, opportune to actually uh, develop such guidelines, and particularly also uh, in accordance and uh, with consultation with uh, particularly angling clubs and groups? 
Uh, I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to, to, to Mr. Ohashin for that. Well, I, I take on board the comments or suggestions of the member, and, and, and think certainly it is useful always, and certainly in this case will be, to look at practice in other uh, jurisdictions. He also touched on a very important matter, and that is of consultation with river users who are primarily anglers. I get uh, plenty of correspondence from anglers on this and many other issues. I know uh, many are very opinionated, but there is a great degree of expertise in the angling community that I believe that myself as Minister, we as a department should be availing of and utilising to get the best outcomes for our environment. Mr. Colm Eastwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The, the Minister will be very aware of the, the real concerns that the anglers have on the River Fahan uh, to some of these applications. Can he uh, give us an update on to, as to where those applications are at? Are they on the River Fahan? <laughs> I thank uh, Mr. Eastwood for that question. My department, my department actually retained three planning applications for uh, hydroelectric power schemes on the Fahan and a further application associated with one of those schemes for the proposed installation of a fish pass. I recently issued a notice of opinion to refuse planning permission for A2011 0237F, a proposal at Crocahilly Road, Claudie, on the grounds of the potential impact on nature conservation interests and the, the loss of active peat. The applicant can, of course, request a hearing before the PAC if they do not accept those reasons. Considering, uh, consideration of the remaining applications is ongoing. Uh, I will be the final decision maker and will fully consider all of the relevant issues and all of the relevant correspondence that I have received before deciding on the way forward. Mr. Pat Sheehan for a question. Question number eight, please. The overwhelming scientific evidence from the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report highlights the dramatic changes to our climate and their causes. Pope Francis's recent interjections on climate change to both EU and USA leaders helped to highlight the moral responsibility that we all have to protect the poorest and most vulnerable groups and regions from the dangers of climate change. I will be attending the COP21 as part of the UK delegation, along with ministers from Scotland and Wales. It is my intention to engage with colleagues from the devolved administrations, Ireland and other countries, to encourage and provide support for a comprehensive global agreement on action on climate change. With the part, I am in regular contact with Minister Kelly in the Department for Environment, Community and Local Government on a range of environmental matters. With the Paris Summit on Climate Change taking place at the end of November, I have agreed that a discussion on climate change will be held at the next NSMC Environment Sector meeting scheduled for the 18th of November. Furthermore, I am keen to frame my input to the Paris discussions from an island of Ireland perspective. To that end, I have written to Minister Kelly and representatives of the Council for Justice and Peace of the Irish Episcopal Conference to arrange a meeting to discuss common issues of concern to be taken forward at the Conference of the Parties. I believe that it is vital that we explore how together we can offer leadership on climate change matters for all the people of Ireland and provide hope to those beyond our shores who are especially vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, but yet have done least to cause the problem. Mr. Sheehan, for a supplementary. I'm sure the minister would agree with me that on such a small island, it's important that he liaises with his counterpart around the issue of climate change. And um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that he's going to have a meeting uh, with his colleague. Uh, at the next uh, North South Ministerial Council meeting on the 18th of November. And could the Minister give a commitment that he will report back on the outcome of that meeting? Uh, thank uh, Mr Sheehan for that supplementary. 
As with all NSMC meetings, there will be a report back uh, to the Chamber on that. A statement will be given and, and questions can be asked. Uh, hopefully, I will not have to wait until that date to have these discussions with Minister Kelly. As I have said, uh, I am hopeful of convening another meeting or, or seminar of sorts in, in the interim, on which I will also be more than happy to report back to the Assembly. Order. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Andy Allen. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can the Minister give an update as to whether his department is on target to meet household recycling targets? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank Mr. Allen for that question. It's also the first that I have received from him, from him, and a very important question that it is, and, and one that many householders and business uh, owners ask me on a, a, a regular basis. Different councils deal differently with uh, their recycling and as a consequence different councils perform uh, differently when it comes to uh, the recycling rates that they achieve. Just tomorrow I will meet with the Waste Programme Board which is the strategic oversight body for dealing with waste right across the north and that will give me a better insight as to who is performing well, how they are performing well and who maybe needs extra help. My department offers much assistance to councils in that regard, be it through capital grants available uh, to councils for plant and machinery to aid them in their recycling efforts. Uh, in response, I suppose, more to the, the, the question, at last glance, councils were performing well and we as a region are performing well. In fact, in the quarter before last was the first time ever that we had actually recycled more waste than we sent to landfill, which was quite a, a landmark achievement. However, we can't afford to be complacent. We have to keep reinforcing the messages to our councils and through our councils on the importance of recycling, not just to our environment, but also to our economy. I'll Mr. Allen for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Um, can the Minister outline what engagement his department is having with the Department of Enterprises, Trade and Investment uh, to meet electricity from renewable sources by 2020? I, uh, I thank the, the member for that question. My officials would be in regular uh, contact with their daddy counterparts on this issue. We do have targets set down in terms of the outputs from renewable energy uh, that we aspire to in the programme for government. Uh, they are set at 35 per cent of energy should be produced from renewable sources by 2025. Currently, as things stand, and if we kept going as we are going, we would be hitting about 33 0.3%, which means less than target, but an admirable enough effort nonetheless. There are other uh, considerations, though, that now will have to come into play, such as uh, this. From, coming from the statement from uh, Minister Bell in the Chamber two weeks ago on the Northern Ireland renewables obligations and the cutting of subsidies to uh, renewable energy providers. Obviously, that will have an impact on how much renewable energy is going to be produced. Mr. Joe Byrne for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline any action that his department has taken in relation to the controversy regarding emissions from the Volkswagen cars that are fitting so strongly at the moment regarding the software that's misrepresenting the pollution? I uh, thank the member for that question, which is indeed uh, very topical and one that would concern me as a Volkswagen driver, and I know you're one as well, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am strongly supporting the development of European Commission proposals for real driving emission standards legislation. This legislation will, if adopted, require car manufacturers to ensure that real-world vehicle emissions comply much more closely with Euro emission standards. Mr. Byrne for a supplementary. 
I want to thank the Minister for uh, tackling the issue. Can the Minister state, however, what can the UK Government or indeed this regional Government do to protect the interests of consumers and those people that have purchased such vehicles who are concerned about the environment and concerned about the miles per gallon uh, performance of these vehicles? I thank Mr Byrne for that supplementary and I am sure the Deputy Speaker is extremely concerned with uh, miles per gallon. I'm also i uh, sure he'd be equally concerned about the prospect that there, there might be an increase in his road tax. This is a matter for the Department for Transport, and at this stage I have heard nothing to indicate that there is any potential on future levels of road tax. In a statement on the 2nd of October this year, the Transport Secretary advised that Volkswagen users and taxpayers, which include those here in the north of Ireland, will not incur higher vehicle excise duty if their existing vehicles are found to be fitted with illegal software that manipulates emissions tests. Call Mr. Colm Eastwood for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to outline uh, the procedure for uh, substituting uh, independent councillors when they resign from council? The legislation which makes provision about the filling of casual vacancies in district councils, including vacancies arising as a result of resignation, is the Electoral Law Act, Northern Ireland, 1962. The 1962 Act was amended in 2010 to change the way in which vacancies in district council seats arising during term are filled. This provides, amongst other matters, for members who stood as independents when elected to be replaced using a list of substitutes provided by the member prior to the vacancy arising. As elections are an accepted matter under Section 4.1 of and Schedule 2 to the Northern Ireland Act 1998, this is therefore a matter for the Secretary of State. I am aware that the Electoral Office here has issued guidance on the filling of casual vacancies. This states that members elected as independents may submit a list of up to six substitutes to the Chief Electoral Officer after the election, who will be contacted in order to fill their seat in the event of that seat becoming vacant during the Council term. On receipt of a notification of a vacancy from an independent member with a substitute list, the Chief Electoral Officer will write to the first named substitute on the list, asking them to confirm in writing within 14 days of the request if they are willing to and able to take the seat. Then if the first name substitute is unable to fill the vacancy, the Chief Electoral Officer will repeat the process of contacting the named substitutes in order until the vacancy is filled or the list is exhausted. If the list is exhausted and no substitute has been declared returned, the vacancy will be filled by way of a by-election. I uh, thank the Minister for that answer, but does the Minister uh, believe that it is acceptable for an independent to resign and then to nominate somebody who is professed to be a member of another political party uh, as their substitute? I thank uh, the, the member for that question. And while it is not illegal or unlawful, it is certainly, in my opinion, unacceptable. I think it is an abuse of electoral rules that may not be fit for purpose uh, to begin with, but it's also an abuse of the democratic will yeah. of the people who might vote for a candidate as an independent without knowing who is on the substitutes list to which I referred earlier. Even now, for councillors across councils in the north who are independents, uh, the people who voted for them have no way of actually ascertaining who the six substitutes are. That's, that's not open for public consumption. Mr. Fran McCann is not in his place. I call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I uh, welcome the Minister's long overdue public support for the creation of an independent environmental protection agency and ask him to outline his plans for the creation of such? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I uh, thank uh, Mr. Little, not, not just for the question, but more so uh, for the support. I know his party colleague and chair of the Environment Committee, uh, Ms. Lowe, has also been extremely receptive to 
the idea since I uh, floated it, as she was to the earlier work done in 2011 by my predecessor when he had uh, discussions and consultation on this uh, very important matter. It is my intention to attend Environment Committee on Thursday when I will be filling them in <laughs> with my plans as to how we proceed uh, towards the establishment or hopefully uh, eventual establishment of an independent environment protection agency. And I wouldn't want to disappoint or certainly wouldn't want to upset <laughs> Ms. Lowe by uh, revealing those details here first. Well, Mr. Little for supplementary. Well, I, I thank the Minister for his response. I'm glad that my colleague, uh, Anna Lewis, Chairperson of the Environment Committee, will be getting a, a front row seat to the unveiling of his plans for the creation of the agency. Um, can I ask the, the Minister then um, just how important uh, an independent environmental protection agency is to safeguarding our, our natural environment and whether he anticipates executive agreement for this? I believe it is very important, and I think it's quite telling, that every other region on these islands has gone down that road and has the model of an independent, or at least arm's length, uh, environmental protection agency. And most of uh, the European nations have uh, similar arrangements as well. I think it will become even more important as we go into the new departmental structures when uh, many of the, most of the environmental or classical environmental uh, functions of DOE will be amalgamated with mm -hmm. those of uh, DARD. I know that's something that has caused quite a lot of concern for environmental NGOs, but not just for environmental en or NGOs. I think when it comes to achieving or securing executive agreement, I think it's something that we have to work with others on. Naturally enough, I think we have to make people aware, not just politicians, but also those in, involved in industry, uh, those involved in agriculture, that they have nothing to fear uh, from an independent environment protection agency. Call Mr. Chris Hazard. I just want to raise it with the Minister again. I have corresponded with him in relation to the marine, recent marine litter survey, uh, a survey that was quite damning on the environmental health of beaches in Ardlas, Kilkeel and Ballyhornan on the south there coast. Yet in response, uh, there seems to be a focus from the Department on the good beaches around uh, Newcastle, Murloc, Torella and Cranfield. Is the Minister and his Department aware of the, the environmental health issues in relation to specifically Ballyhornan Beach? I uh, th thank the member for the question and I'm familiar with the marine litter uh, survey to which he, he refers. My department have been active with council who retain ultimate responsibility for the cleanliness of, of, of beaches and working on m all of the beaches in uh, the, 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 the South Down area where there are specific issues to or on specific beaches. I'd certainly be happy to meet with the member and have my officials meet with their uh, council counterparts as opposed to devise ways in which that can be best tackled. I know as regards our glass, which is in the members' own constituency, a, a lot of work has been done there with the fishermen of our glass, and my department continues to fund a fishing for litter scheme, which has had an impact in reducing the amount of litter washing ashore on the beaches, the beautiful beaches uh, of South Down. I know this is uh, something that the member does have a particular interest in, and I, I couldn't blame him, being uh, also familiar with the natural beauty of South Down. No. <laughs> it's not Margaret for supplementary. Mr. Hazard for supplementary. Go on, Margaret Laskin, call you and thank the Minister for that. I'm sure Margaret will be delighted to hear that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer, but, but when it comes to Ballyhornan, and in specific reference to the, the, the continual pumping of raw sewage into the sea, this would not be accepted on the Gold Coast of North Down. Why should the people of South Down have to accept raw sewage being pumped into our sea? I uh, thank the, the, the Member again for that supplementary. It's something that, again, I, I've undertaken to work with him 
uh, with Council on and also with other government departments who clearly have an interest and a responsibility uh, to addressing and eradicating uh, th this issue. I don't know, know where within uh, DRD's plans uh, th there might be plans to upgrade uh, the, the, the pumping system there, but certainly if we can lend support <laughs> to locals in that area in lobbying at DRD, we certainly will do so, given the negative environmental impact it's clearly having. Order, time is up and we must now 